ladies and gentlemen, and uh, let's get started. Uh, my name is Pekka Viljakainen, and I am the advisor uh, of the Skolkova Foundation, the president of Skolkova Foundation, and also running and at least being the godfather of many startup activities, not only at Skolkovo, but working very closely between the, all the federal institutions here in Russia. As you can hear from my accent, I'm a Finn. They call me here as a Finsky coin, a Finnish horse, which is known as a very reliable, not very smart, but very reliable. And uh, that's why I'm uh, hosting also this session today. I have a very uh, respected guest here today. Uh, Mr. Abusov uh, is uh, a little bit late, uh, will be in one hour late, but shit happens. Uh, and, but we will, we will start anyway now. Um, I give the floor for each member to, to introduce themselves uh, in a very short way in their op opening words. But I also want to, inform, compared to the original program, I'm very happy to have Mr. Igor Agamirzian here as a co-moderator. Igor is the, is the, uh, the president, the chief executive of the Russian venture company. But moreover, I think my knowledge about uh, entrepreneurship and startup issues in Russia is like three years. But uh, Igor, he hates when I call him as a grand old man, but he's not old. He's just, he has a knowledge about startups in Russia and, and these activities. So that's why I'm very happy to welcome Igor to be here. And he will make his own remarks and also the closing remarks. Uh, our topic today is uh, uh, about what the government, do it in a very simple way what government should do and should not do to get innovations booming. This is the very simplistic way. Uh, and um, first of all, uh, in my short intro, I want to say that somehow word in innovation is mystified. It's mystified in my home country in Finland. It's definitely mystified in Russia. Uh, it's same in China, it's everywhere. To me, innovation and the projects like Skolkovo or this forum, the final outcome is to have people to have well-paid new jobs created. That's the measurement. So it's not how many patent applications we are doing or how many square meters of techno parks we are building, which is the easy KPI, the real KPI, whether we are able to generate new jobs. It doesn't happen overnight, but that's the measurement. And uh, that, that's what I want to say at the beginning. Secondly, I have been in Russia in 47 Russian cities in past two years. So in last spring, in 32 alone in Russian startup tour, I can tell you that this is a really big country. Uh, that's no news, but uh, I want to say that what this is my view, what government should do I mean federal government, but also the regional government, to make sure that all the institutions are working together. Uh, I know that uh, some people might take it very bad way, but I will say it anyway. I think one of the biggest problems in Russian regions is not to find entrepreneurs. It's not to find funding or not to find uh, platforms to grow their business. The problem is how do we get our institutions to work together? Competing universities, competing institutions, private and public techno parks and so forth. And, and that is my second observation. Thirdly, uh, and then we will, I will give the floor uh, to the uh, other panelists. Uh, in my world, there are three different ways to define the role of the state in innovation business. And I hope to hear views of your all. With what do you believe? First of all, there is a view from uh, many entrepreneurs. And I would say it's a US way or British way or even Finnish way. And it is that government should stay away, stay away from business. Government should stay away from big business but government should stay away definitely on the small business. That's view one, number one, that government should have no role on fostering innovations. The other view, and this is view number two, 
is that government can play important role of building platforms for people to start their business and to lower the barrier by grant financing, by building technoparks and so forth. Then there is a third view, and this is the most provocative view. It is very totalitarian view saying that we ordered our regions to innovate and our target is to have 10,000 patents. And not the mentioning about the people, not the mentioning about the entrepreneurship culture, but it's like an order, because let's make innovations. And I think the panelists today will tell their own views about what the government should do. I will tell my view later on, but these are the basic assumptions, uh, are my views uh, to, to start this dialogue. And uh, I think I will start uh, from my right, ladies first. Anna, uh, you could tell how this world looks like from your standpoint and then we can go over. We will, we will have a very short presentation, just a couple of minutes, each of us, and not presentation, commentary, and then we will go directly to the questions. So please, Anna. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jo, from, coming from the Barcelona City Council. Uh, talking about Barcelona and innovation is a long path, so I'm not going to do it so long. But some ideas uh, that began long, long time ago. Uh, but I would like to, to say that this year Barcelona was named as the e-capital, so the European capital of innovation, so that may be one first point. Uh, we have a view that the government has a role, <laughs> I think. And I'm going to explain just one specific project that we think is innovative, where we took really this role. In fact, uh, all began in 2006. Uh, my role is in the Economic Promotion Agency. So what we wanted is to help companies to innovate, but the subsidiaries were, no, the model, were not the model anymore. So we wanted to change it. And we, th we thought that the public procurement could be a tool to do it. So we wanted really to link the contract, so the, pub the really public procurement with innovation. And we had really huge difficulties with legal terms. It was really not easy at all, but we learned a lot in the process. And we decided that the, uh, one step behind this, but before this, could be to foster pilots in the city, to help companies to test their, their products in the city. And uh, we also began to work in international challenges to look for innovative solutions internationally and then to help them to pilot these in Barcelona. Um, after quite a lot of years, in 2013, just last year, uh, after a lot of pilots in the city, we, we tried to put the same question. Can we, do, can we really do uh, innovative public procurement? And then we knew that it could be possible, but we didn't know how. And finally, we define a process where we are buying from the city council based on challenges, but not the product, but the challenge. So what's the problem-based uh, procurement? And also, uh, finally, there's a contract. So the, the, the innovative that present their products to the city or their solutions, they get the photo with the mayor, they get the pilot, but finally they get the contract. That's what they are looking for. Uh, I'm not going to explain it all because it will be long. We are a lot of us, but the, the main pro th point is that we put 1 million euros to do that. We put six challenges coming from different areas in the city, and we did it. And, and this helped not only to promote entrepreneurship, but to increase the quality of services in the city. And at the end, it changes a little bit the culture internally in the city council because uh, people in the procurement process know about the innovation and how could be the, the good points on that. So I'm not going to do all of it. Uh, you can have the presentation and you have the website um, to, oh, to have all the process. I have to say that uh, City Mar here, they will, they will explain. They help us in the process and we receive more than 100 proposals and now 
I'm not going to explain this because it will be too, too long. And now we are uh, in, the final, um, in, the, in the final process where we are really choosing the winner and we will implement the next months. The, just one word, it was hard to attract companies because it was the first time that was this type of process linked with procurement. But we did, I think, a good job explaining how it works because SMEs have no experience doing public procurement in Spain and in Europe. It's difficult for them, but I think we did a good job also changing the culture for them. So that's it. Thank you very much. And so I guess your answer. So, so I guess your answer is with your very practical presentation that yes, government can take an active role on helping. Yes, that's what we're trying to do. We really think we have a role. In fact, uh, the economic promotion agency, we help entrepreneurs, we help them growing and having financial uh, investment, etc. But really, we think that we have a role in, in fact, in a lot of domains. Urban people, because people is very important and to mix sectors and, and creative people in the city, but also business okay. and government itself. Okay. Well, um, as a Finn, I, I have to tell you, uh, not a joke, but the reality that this procurement, especially in the government sector, is not the easiest thing here. Um, when I was in, uh, in Finland, I, it was difficult to get money, too difficult to get the budget. In Russia, it's easy to get the budget, but very difficult to buy anything. <laughs> so, but that's another story. It, it can, we can have another discussion about the reasons for that. Um, Sasha, what is, uh, very quickly, how do you see this story from your side? Yeah. yeah just. Okay, I'll, I'll, um, I won't explain in, in great detail what we do, but uh, basically what you're saying is absolutely true. When we started City Mart uh, three and a half years ago, um, everyone said you're crazy because our mission was to open up government procurement, local government procurement, um, in the way that we've, we've done it with Barcelona. And in fact, we work with 54 cities, cities like Barcelona, Paris, London, San Francisco, and Moscow in the last year to actually go through that process. Um, let me go one step back. First of all, um, the German Association of Taxpayers publishes an annual report called the Black, Black Book. And anyone who has never seen this should take a look at it. It's fascinating. It's the, from their perspective, the biggest misuses of public spending. And this year, their report started by saying the biggest uh, waste of tax money has been when government thought they were in business, when they were entrepreneurial, when they were investing in businesses and so forth. And I think there's a, an important lessons uh, in there. So we think that actually city government spending 10% of world GDP every year is an incredible resource. Government using procurement as a resource and I'll tell you just a small story of two cities spending four and a half million dollars. So in St. Paul, in Minnesota, um, the city decided to invest in solutions to support the blind people for four and a half million US dollars. And they bought speaking traffic lights, which is a product that is off the shelf. They did a standard RFP, a standard specification for speaking traffic light. It doesn't help the blind people at all. It's a solution that doesn't solve any problem. But the blind people were grateful because government thought of them. Uh, the same year in 2011, we had um, Boris, a citizen in uh, Stockholm, talk to us about how he now feels 90% less disabled. City spent four and a half million dollars at exactly the same time with the same market knowledge and theory and the same opportunity. And what they did was they put the problem first. They didn't specify how to improve the blind person's lives, but they put the issue at the center. And when you're doing this, you're beginning to address some important asymmetries in government. Um, procurement today relies on just 3% average market knowledge. Um, cities don't know, city governments don't know how to process new ideas. They don't trust new business providers. So if you look at that inefficiency, there's a huge amount of leverage you can create at very low risk because you're still spending money to solve real problems in society. And so our approach is that cities have to open problems, they have to um, lead the change, and it's really a question of culture change, whether we're seeing procurement as a defensive measure or something constructive. And in Moscow, we started working uh, with the innovation agency, and um, 
we started to look at how can we enable Moscow to become part of this trading community of cities. On the left side here you see cities that are publishing problems and on the right side you see where the solutions come from this trading. So in short, I think the, the, the issue is that actually government has a huge amount of resource that is underused with a massive opportunity um, for leveraging procurement to achieve much better results. Very good. Um, we wanted to start this discussion with the Barcelona case uh, because when we talk about what government can do, it's always or almost always reflected that give money and uh, just give money to something and wait something. But actually there are many other ways of the government contribution and if, you, if you can do it. And that's why we think that this uh, procurement issue is one of those. But Igor, um, now word to my co-moderator in the sense that, Igor, how, um, you have been watching this uh, uh, development quite many years, I mean, building the entrepreneurship. What is your view? what government should not do, what government should not do. Uh, we will record the answer, please. I will go into Russian. Uh, so I think the simplest answer is the state, the government shouldn't compete business. And that is the most important thing that shouldn't do any way not the government, not, nor any other institution shouldn't compete business on behalf of uh, the state. But how? It's quite another story. So as a rule, when a government starts investment mechanisms uh, for innovation, very often they uh, become, you know, s uh, just self uh, institutions uh, which start developing in accordance with different business law. Any agent of the state on the market should be in balance. Uh, with their regulation uh, should uh, should be in balance between the uh, business and the state rules. So if it ignores the business uh, environment, then it becomes useless for the for the state. But if it integrates into the business too much as a, as a state representative, it starts competing uh, the business. And, uh, and step by step uh, can uh, just destroy the strategy uh, which it should actually was uh, to support. So what should the government do? This, I think, is a more difficult question. Well, today, uh, within the environment of uh, business technologies and history, we sometimes complicate the issues too much. So even today, I've heard uh, some uh, things which are rather myths and not uh, innovation. Uh, and people have got used to it. For instance, some legends or myths, uh, they say there, there are so little entrepreneurs in Russia. Uh, well, uh, and it is not uh, right, absolutely, because uh, uh, when we when we needed and uh, when we need actual entrepreneurs, well, uh, it turned out that uh, well, business businessmen, actual entrepreneurs. Uh, solved uh, the issue government, the Soviet government, couldn't solve because uh, business environment actually uh, gave uh, food and uh, uh, clothes to the people. This is the problem uh, the government couldn't solve. But uh, so today, uh, the inv uh, well, you know, uh, money require very simple rules. So when the market is empty, uh, when there is no competitive environment, uh, so no innovations will help. So to develop business, we ought to develop competitive environment. And that becomes comp competing the government because uh, the government says we need these innovations to uh, create new working places, no new jobs. And this is wrong because these 
this all should serve the, the same uh, issue uh, because if we lose competitive environment uh, it will keep it will kill business it will kill innovations so we'll have uh, business uh, you know areas departments but it will not be a business so you remember when one 100 uh, years ago uh, Ford uh, created the conveyor system uh, it killed the system which existed before uh, so uh, I uh, uh, and my generation witnessed uh, the problem uh, when uh, people, uh, when typists uh, were useless, couldn't find jobs because uh, of computers. So what does it mean? Uh, innovations uh, and business should be together. успешных, удачных в разных странах. В России, на мой взгляд, хотя... Мы можем рассказать разные примеры более или менее успешных, хотя в России, как и в России, мы имеем определенную традицию мифов, понимания, что все плохо, и люди говорят, как плохо это в России. Но я думаю, что в России сегодня это очень хороший пример успехов, uh, when uh, uh, the government sets a task of the importance of uh, innovations and it uh, provides the transformation of the business throughout the country. Of course, there are several factors uh, which influence uh, these processes additionally, but specifically the data of the changes on the global markets show that um, Russia entered uh, the five countries of uh, the leaders of venture in investments. And uh, Russia is the second market in Russia. Uh, uh, Russia is the second market in Europe from the point of uh, the investment markets. Of course, uh, these are facts. And I believe that it will be correct not to counter position uh, whether to stimulate or to enforce. But we have to look at the equilibrium of uh, the experience of different countries. For example, uh, the experience of Finland and the uh, Tekas uh, comp organization, which is in a sense uh, a brother company or brother organization for us. When we met first uh, time, Kaspek, uh, uh, that we found in our discussion that our organization, our organizations are quite similar and close to each other uh, in the number of employees and the number of uh, investments and uh, equities in operations. Uh, the only difference is that the population is 5 million in uh, Finland and uh, 140 million in uh, Russia. Well, if Pick uh, can express uh, his opinion, this would be very useful. Pekkas are very handsome in Finland. So, as a side comment, but um, now moving to Pekka Soini, who is, uh, who is running the Tekes, and I think I have tried to explain that Tekes, in many senses, like Skolkovo Foundation on the granting policy. But um, I, I make the same specific question to you, Pekka. Um, now it's 2014. What Tekes will do differently 2020? I mean, in coming five years, to, inf I mean, to get the things rolling even better. I mean, what you have learned in your past 35 years, not you personally, but as a TECES, as an organization, please. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Pekka. <clears throat> Probably all people don't know what is TECES really. That is a Finnish funding, government-owned Finnish funding agency. Our annual volume is about 600 million euros, means that close to 30 billion rubles and uh, our instruments are loans, grants, and also capital uh, investments. But it is only capital investments, it's only fund of funds. So we are not investing directly to the companies. Uh, yes, um, you know, this basic question, I guess that you, Pekka, knows it very well, that uh, our approach is really to stimulate uh, market. 
And uh, what we are now looking at in Finland also, that it is not only, you know, innovation doesn't come from, you know, research, science and then innovation. It comes from multiple sources. Definitely science is important piece of it, but it is not the only one. Uh, and uh, we are looking more and more kind of the innovation environment. So what does it mean uh, to, to create innovation environment and what kind of means to stimulate, in, uh, best ways to stimulate innovations? Standards and norms, regulations, those all should support innovative environment. Also uh, kind of the systemic thinking that whole innovation environment should be thought all the time. And that is kind of the new thing also in Finland, how we are looking at what is the innovation path uh, to the markets. And, uh, and that's that's important issue. And another one, what is important, what is also emerging now uh, in Finland, uh, this culture and people's mindset. So are these innovators, appreciated, even celebrated, like rock stars, um, uh, and, and, and are innovators rewarded? Is entrepreneurship something that young people really appreciate? And that turn we have seen in Finland, uh, specifically uh, some uh, kind of lead universities have been shown the way. Um, uh, but anyway, so that is another point, this culture, innovation culture and mindset, appreciated. For example, what ha happens after bankruptcy? So you should be celebrated that, hey, good, try and try again. Um, then also um, what we are looking at and uh, we had done also successfully is, uh, and, and also looking forward, what we are going to do is leadership in societal challenges. Healthcare, education, environment, energy. Those are the means where you know government has or is, has an issue, and then that, that is a global issue as well. So then you can demand, uh, or you can create demand in in certain areas, and, and government can be a market actor, in a sense. And and there we come to this same issue what was discussed before. Public procurement definitely is an, is an issue and, and, um, and that can, should be used part of the innovation policy and part of the innovation en environment. And then, uh, you know, when I was talking about this uh, innovation environment and also the innovation system, that means that even, you know, state shouldn't be much involved in go-to-market area. But anyway, we look to innovation as a whole path. So that means that global markets, international business is always required. Finland is so small country, you know, only five million people. We don't, we are not really a market, but we are a, we are a very good test bed. We are a very good pilot environment, and therefore we always require global business. And there are different means what governments can do, and what we have done, and we continue to do uh, as Tekes, uh, we will. Uh, we create different kind of programs. One example, Arctic Seas program, what we triggered earlier this year, we have about 20 programs running in any given time. And this Arctic Seas program is 100 uh, million a program, what means that it is uh, uh, 5, billion, uh, 5 billion rubles running over four years and there we are, we are seeking international partners which have also interest for Arctic seas and cold environment. Russia is very natural partner uh, for example in this kind of particular pro program. So just to mention a few but, but this, ki this kind of issues we are working on and, and probably on the, on the agenda also in 2020. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you Pekka. Uh, first of all, Mr. Wang, welcome to the panel. As you can see, we are heating up. We have uh, more members coming, which is great. But before that, uh, Mr. Tutsi, you are watching this from the very international perspective, and you are also advisory uh, for, for many countries and many leaders. Same question. It seems that, guys, you are giving your own answers, whatever I ask. But I do a specific answer. <laughs> What do you think going forward, based on your experience coming five years, for example, 
what is the direction? I mean, what should be done, what should not be done to get these things rolling? Please, sir. Right. Thank you, Pekka. Uh, I wanted to actually answer two of your points that you mentioned earlier. First, should governments uh, be involved? Uh, I think the short answer is yes. I think without government involvement, I think innovation will stifle, will not be sustainable for the long term. So governments can play a very, very important role uh, in any economy, in any part of the world, because one of the primary responsibilities of government is economic development. So that would be my first immediate response. The second thing which you said, which I thought is very, very relevant, is we have federal governments, we've got regional governments, we've got state level, and we've got city governments in practically every country. And oftentimes, there is such misalignment between these various government agencies. And what happens is innovation, which I always believe is one of the most abused word uh, in today's uh, economy, uh, you find a lot of money being spent by governments, but nothing ends up happening out of that. So these become investments that go nowhere, in my opinion. So that is why I think it's important that we have an alignment. And I think what I'm going to share with you now, hopefully will put some perspective to what I think governments can do and should do to address these challenges that many, many countries face. And the first is government, you know, besides providing funding and other infrastructure, whether it's hard infrastructure or soft infrastructure, should I believe focus on addressing global challenges. Okay? Obviously, each country has its unique challenges. But addressing global challenges becomes very important, in my opinion. Global employability, uh, aging population is a big concern most countries are facing, especially in the developed economies. Uh, there is a human capital challenge. Even though countries have a lot of people, but that doesn't mean those people are employable. They don't have the skill levels. So that is a big challenge in many of these countries. Resources are a big challenge in many countries, whether it's water resource, whether it's metals, whether it's minerals, these resources are a challenge in big, big countries. So what I believe the governments can do is to first understand these global challenges and try and make these challenges uh, for their specific uh, geographies that they are dealing with. And what this does actually is allows to create a, a kind of an alignment between all the various agencies, governments, semi-government, uh, non-profits, etc., that are involved in the R&D. So what this does is it gives you a clear vision and strategy and company and the agencies can all work together. And by, in order to do that, you have to understand these global challenges. At the same time, you have to understand where the current industries are and what the future of these industries will be. And what that means is understanding the key mega trends that are happening in the world today. Urbanization, which is, I believe, one of the largest mega trends, is happening today. Cities like Moscow, Shanghai, and all the major cities in the world today are seeing an influx of huge population. What does that mean? That means governments can focus uh, their companies, their investment in areas of providing products and solutions that can address this massive mega trend that is happening in the world today. The second is competitive and benchmarking. And I believe if the governments can not just do the benchmarking, but make sure that that benchmarking is relevant to their country, then I think it makes it very important. And there's a lot more direct impact in those investment areas. Now, governments can play a very active role. And what I mean by that is uh, corporates are focused on creating demands for their products, looking at markets. But governments can actually help in creating the mind share and bringing in foreign direct investment and creating the opportunities for the same companies and making them successful in global markets. So how, what does this mean to the Russian government and what can Russia as a country do in order to make this happen? First, I believe is every startup, any entrepreneur activity it does is focuses on uh, being and thinking global. Obviously, there is a lot of investment going on the R&D side. That needs to continue to happen, in my opinion. But I think the part that I'm most excited about is to create this culture of innovation. Uh, Pekka here mentioned in uh, Finland, innovation gets rewarded, success gets rewarded. But I believe also failure should be rewarded too. This is a cultural challenges 
most countries face today. And I believe, since I come from Silicon Valley in the US, I can tell you with great confidence that when you talk to CEOs in that country and ask them, where would you put your investment? When they look at people who have entrepreneurship ideas, they look for people who have failed multiple times. So failure is rewarded, recognized, and promoted. This is a cultural shift. It doesn't happen overnight. In many cultures, especially in the Middle East, failure to business is failure in life. So that's the change I recommend that needs to be bring in. And government can play a very important role because governments have a long-term view compared to corporates. So like I said, there are some governments that play an active role. And I think as, as, is if governments play the role of an enabler, then I believe governments can have a very important role to play and stimulate economic development in the country. I say, once you start addressing global challenges and mega trends, you can identify key areas of focus and direct all the energies and resources in that direction. So you can convert uh, innovation into invoicing. If you're not able to convert that and make money, that innovation means nothing. And then finally, in my concluding remarks, it's important for governments to work and stimulate the economy by making sure they bring in capital, they help in creating both hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure. And, and there are some very good examples of what different governments have done, and those can be easily brought into the Russian context, and I think we can see great success <coughs> for the long term. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, yeah, before moving to have a little bit Russian corporate view to this same story, I must tell you that we have the same problem in Finland and in Russia. Okay. You talked about learning about failures, but mm -hmm. we don't do failures here. Okay. We have a tremendous problem. No failures, that's why we cannot uh, just joking. So, <laughs> but having the corporate view, having the corporate view, first of all, I want to thank you, Mr. Trashuk, for sponsoring this session on behalf of Open Innovation. But uh, even more, I would like to hear your corporate view once again with the same setting what we started. What should be done and should not be done to accelerate the things further on. Please, sir. Uh, uh, Pekka, thank you for your question. First of all, I would like to say uh, it is quite natural and evident the first reaction to the position of the uh, whether the government can be neutral towards the process of innovations in the economy. Of course not. On one hand, uh, this is a dilemma whether to stimulate or to enforce. I think this is uh, uh, this dilemma is somewhat uh, artificial, and the government must be stimulated and enforced. And uh, in essence, it's just uh, the same process, uh, just taking into account positive and negative incentives. Of course, uh, the government must create the environment. I'm not going to dwell upon this a lot. Of course, the environment is important from the point of uh, the innovations and uh, innovative system, but, uh, but the colleagues already told a lot about it. But I want to say that uh, there are things indispensable from the point of view of the government. This is to find the long-term trends and tendencies and the description of it and the creation of uh, rules and uh, approaches which are important for the state in the future. And as in general, it is necessary to form the positions of business. For example, what would be the long-term environmental requirements? This will create the conditions to understand what are the trends, the investments, and the necessary results. Uh, of business uh, to be proposed to the market. The same thing is the problems of formation, the approaches of rules and uh, necessities. Unfortunately, the norms sometimes fall behind of the requirements of business. And I can say that in Russia, there was quite a number of uh, projects implemented uh, not in the proper way, uh, taking into account uh, new materials and new uh, approaches, but uh, there were norms and we could not use the most innovative materials. And the f previous speaker said a very important point that the government must and have to, and this is one of the most important things, to create the global agenda for the Russian business. 
it means uh, that every company uh, which announces that it is innovative, but it will become innovative when it can sell it, its products it, to other markets and will create its products being oriented at the global market. Unfortunately, we do not have this attitude always, and I think this is quite uh, important. And the final moment that I would like to mention, this is the enforcement. I don't think 10 patents a month uh, uh, or 11, uh, well, well, these figures are so important. But uh, uh, very often uh, figures like this and regulations appear for us. And we st state institutions feel it as kind of burden which suppresses the innovative activity. So this should be balanced. Uh, all should be efficient, effective, and productive. And uh, more and more people should be involved in this process. So it's so difficult to keep up such kind of balance to, do, uh, to ensure this kind of KPI. But otherwise, it won't uh, work. Um, uh, moving to Mr. Gurgo, uh, I would like to hear uh, from you the same story. Uh, of course, it's interesting to hear how you are using uh, the current boom of the startups uh, and uh, small businesses in your own growth, if you are. But uh, the main question still remains, what should be done differently to be, let's say, 50% better 2020? What is your view on this, sir? Thank you very much, uh, Pekka. I think this is kind of provocative question for our panel discussion more uh, because, uh, well, state instruments for uh, innovation requires uh, time uh, and uh, requires some specificity. So, I mean, the market develops, and uh, so the market, uh, the state should uh, participate more or less depending on this de market development. Sometimes, uh, as uh, Cody says, uh, enforcement, uh, we see too much. Uh, regarding the innovative market where we work, we can see that it has uh, passed several stages. The first one was too chaotic. When they were very small and weak companies, they couldn't fund uh, innovation. They couldn't expand on the market. Uh, on the next stage, uh, the state joined. Uh, and so we saw consolidation, uh, well, the increase of companies and there were new ideas, new technological solutions, uh, and, uh, well, some uh, expansions when uh, major companies started uh, creating kind of ecosystems and networks. And at this very stage, uh, again, uh, the state participation uh, is required uh, to stimulate uh, the environment to stimulate the development. So, starting from the year 2002, we witnessed uh, the uh, different but effective and productive participation of the state concerning innovations. So, concerning the jobs, uh, I would like to state one more thing. A lot depends on uh, innovations uh, and the changes. So, I mean, in a supermarket, uh, we can uh, optimize a lot. Uh, and as a result, we can see a computer uh, well produced in China with Indian software instead of uh, several jobs. So question arises, how important, how good it is for the country. Uh, so it turns out we create jobs uh, out of the country where we have this kind of uh, innovations in a quotation mark. So we ought to understand what we mean by innovation and how it should be productive and for the, this country and useful. Thank you. Your last comment was the, the very valuable in a sense that uh, I always remember that when in my childhood 
I was lucky to be in a team to make first e-banking applications. And we were of course very excited, we made a hell of a lot of money and we were modernizing. But at the same time, 50% of the people in the banks lost their jobs. So consumers were happy, banks were modernized, they made, banks were made money, but it has sincerely this kind of influence is also on the society. But on the other hand, like I said that time, I still don't stop. I don't say that stop the development, stop the innovation, because that would never make the global co competitiveness to happen. But uh, now um, I would like to make a question for uh, Mr. Wang Jivu. Uh, I don't know how this translation is working here, uh, but uh, I think you have a, we can go sentence by sentence to hear your comments. Um, you were not here at the beginning uh, when we started, but the basic question is that if there are three directions, if there is a direction where some people say that government is not, should not be at all involved in entrepreneurship, or then there is another element who says that government should only focus on people, legislative system, kind of a surroundings. And then there is a third dimension that government should order uh, regions and universities to generate innovations. Uh, this is not the political debate here, but what is your personal view coming from the People's Republic of China? What your government is doing in the next phase to really stimulate the innovation and what it should not be doing, sir? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, five minutes ago, I signed an agreement with uh, Square Cover Group. So, <laughs> a little few minutes. Sorry. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think uh, government is very important in, for our company and for all the science park, all innovation project. Uh, our company. Uh, uh, task holding group have invested and uh, built uh, 25 science park or science cities in China. So I must uh, uh, must uh, to cooperate with uh, 25 cities uh, chief official. So I think uh, government is uh, too important. Uh, government uh, he uh, they do three things. Uh, one, when, when, when I began a project, we, the government must uh, give me a permission, maybe delay, delay, or forbid. Uh, the next thing, the government, uh, they make the rules, and uh, so, so I think uh, that uh, the three thing, the third thing, they may be an uh, investment, maybe a uh, venture capital, also okay. So I think the government, they should do good, do better in when they are investment or capital venture, uh, especially for younger, young, especially for small capital companies, the governments must do better. And uh, in another thing, uh, I, I don't, don't think if government uh, do more is good, I think government, if they manage a few, may be better. Uh, it, such as our company, we build uh, very, very many projects uh, we start a very many uh, business plan. Uh, when in the in, in the f f first step, I think uh, if government do few, maybe better. So this, this is my opinion. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, now we have um, gone through. Um, the first round, uh, we have uh, plenty of time to discuss. Uh, I will ask to 
my uh, co-moderator Igor, uh, if you have a, a burning question under the after these comments, um, we don't have any order like going step by step. So just raise your hand if you have a comment. But Igor, please, if you have a question for the for anybody or all of the audience. Actually. Uh, I have some uh, generic question to maybe virtually everybody, but uh, there was one moment which actually uh, made me to think about the ideas of the in enforcement of the innovation, right? Я перейду на русский, потому что мне кажется rather turn into Russian. I'll try to uh, just uh, to say it more precisely because uh, this issue was ar was arose in the, in the Russian presenta presentation. So uh, one of the speakers finished uh, with the words uh, just in innovation enforce enforcement. And this is as I see a Russian tradition which reflects the reality we have today, uh, the, which is a kind of cultural approach. What can be enforced? Something which nobody really needs. And this is not innovation, because innovations are developing. Uh, they should be bought. They should be transported, can be transformed. Uh, but what can be imposed? Something which uh, doesn't change the business. Uh, but this is a Russian tradition, unfortunately. So no wonder this term was used here in Russian presentation. But I would like to ask all of you this question. Do you think innovations are in demand by the state, by economy, by all of us as uh, physical persons, or is it something which should be imposed? Who would like to answer, please? But, you know that um, uh, one philosophy is, and I guess that it is sustainable philosophy, that uh, any company to be competitive in a marketplace, they have to do R&D. And that is something that uh, you can say that it is imposed, but it is not really, it can't be imposed. I exactly agree with you, but it has to be the mentality that you have to spend, for example, 5% of your revenue to R&D, to be constantly competitive in the marketplace. And I know a few, middle-sized companies, for example, in, in Finland, which have that in their, uh, you know, kind of strategy. In bad times or in good times, they always invest that amount. So that might be something that, uh, that you can think that uh, you can't innovate, or let's say that uh, innovation comes from the uh, kind of the uh, kind of the practice and, and uh, comes from the uh, culture of the company. Uh, but then also it is something that uh, it's built into culture for a longer term and uh, you can't miss one year, for example. This year we can't spend R&D because we can't afford, but you know, next year they can be lost. Mr. Trashev. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to add on the point. Speaking about Russian terms, unfortunately, it is like this. And uh, so uh, being a professor in uh, high school of economy, I can say that uh, in uh, so the new ideas and innovations sometimes uh, have wrong definitions because uh, innovation is uh, something which is already on the market. And that is why it is in demand concerning uh, creation of uh, innovation is a process where you cannot stop. If you stop once, then you will not be able to catch up with others. Any other comments on this? Uh, yeah. No, yeah. Please, sir. This yeah. works? Oh, yes. 
Um, so I, I would I would simply add that um, uh, putting the consumer or the user or the citizen value first and at the center is a really important continued driver for innovation. And I think if we apply this to government, one thing we've seen in particular in Europe is government externalizing innovation, creating agencies that support innovation without really reforming itself. And I think creating transparency in government in particular and beginning by changing some of the structures in government is a really important part of the innovation project. That is why we were able in Sweden, you have an active policy to dismantle and change government through innovation, which very, very few countries explicitly have. Even though most company, uh, countries, for example, governments have innovation programs to invest in innovation in business and other communities, but excluding themselves. And with it comes regulatory change, with it comes all the changes that actually open up markets and create opportunities. Okay, uh, we can move to the next question. Um, I was um, in a big uh, angel investor event. Um, I, I, I don't look like an angel, but I'm also an angel investor. And, uh, and um, there, uh, there was a very straight question for me. Why? Why uh, I am investing to the European and particular to Russian startups? And uh, there are four reasons for it. But the number one reason was that I honestly believe that in Europe, by large, let's say Western world by large, and definitely in Russia, big companies cannot innovate enough. There is a strong culture that let's do by it. We have a budget, we can innovate whatever. And, um, but it's not, everybody knows that Apple is not Apple without 50 to 60 acquisitions per year. Microsoft is not Microsoft without hundreds of acquisitions of small technologies. My, uh, Google is not Google without purchasing a lot of companies and getting those innovations as a part of their corporate strategy. Noel, this sounds easy, but because we are in Moscow, my question actually to anybody in the audience is that, of course, you could make a law, like Russia has certain laws, that a certain percent of the R&D must be spent not for own R&D, but purchasing those technologies. I personally, I am against of this kind of that spend 5% and it's a law. Because then you do it in the last day of the calendar year and then you just tick the box that I bought just something with 5% of my budget. What is your view on this? It, it would be interesting to hear. I could imagine that in China there are very strong state companies. Is there a similar kind of a laws or ideas? I would like to know, hear from Russian enter, uh, enterprise world, but also what should be done in this to stimulate the, let's say, call it exit market of these companies, because then there would be a liquidity on the market. So what, how the CLONAS is doing this? Thank you very much for a very important question. As I see it, Russia has enough skills for funding different M&D uh, deals, but too little successful examples of integration of the smaller startups uh, into a bigger environment or bigger companies. Uh, so concerning integration of corporate uh, structures and uh, concerning uh, getting better effect of uh, these smaller uh, assets. I faced a difficulty like this myself. Let me not go into detail, but this is the factor which stops from uh, great development of high scale uh, innovative companies in Russia. So this lack in uh, effective and efficient integration of smaller teams, smaller companies in the huge networks in the big companies which can together do some kind of deals and innovations and processes. Uh, but I believe that uh, this is where governments actually unfortunately end up, instead of being an enabler, uh, when you start mandating these kinds of issues. Okay. Okay. So once um, this is where I, I believe uh, governments, rather than being enablers, when they start mandating that 
certain percentages to be used for acquisition purposes is I think where you lose the creativity and innovativeness because what ends up happening, like you said, Pekka, it's a checkbox and you end up a uh, suboptimal purchase of a company that may not necessarily be in alignment with what you're trying to accomplish. So I think personally, this is where the government should, government should stay out of. Allow corporates to make the right business decision based on market forces, based on market opportunities. Like I mentioned earlier, the government can play a role in giving some direction to where innovation should happen and what sectors it should happen and how they might help in addressing certain challenges. In giving that direction, in stimulating that, in funding that, companies will get created and when they get created, they are normal acquisition targets. And what you rightly said is true. Large companies are not agile enough to, to innovate fast enough. And so what they do is look for companies that are perfect acquisition targets and because it's driven off market forces, the acquisition is, is sustainable, it's long term, and, and, and makes for the right kinds of decisions from corporates. And that's what uh, allows economic development in the long run. How about Pekka? What do you think about this? Yeah, you know, that it is a different thing if there is a state-owned company and there is a kind of, the, kind of the governmental regulation or rules that's totally different ballgame. But uh, when thinking about large corporations, one of the very large corporations in the IT world, uh, I don't want to say its name, but uh, they have a kind of rule that the kind of the best performing business, or this best performing business, uh, they take 5% out of their R&D every year to be invested in other businesses, because that's the, always uh, the, very often the trap that something what is selling and do, doing very well uh, fails to renew itself. And uh, you know, that is very interesting phenomena, but in that large corporation, they have a rule that, uh, for example, heads of the businesses, they are not rewar rewarded mainly on their own business, but they are rewarded for the totality of their businesses. So then they also kind of understand that of their profits and of their spending, they have to contribute to the renewal of the company. And I guess that that's the whole story, that how you build the practice systems that you constantly renew yourself. I mean, this forced approach never works, but there needs to be an idea behind. Yeah, thank you, Igor. Uh, and, uh, uh, I think uh, quite a number of uh, very interesting and uh, curious uh, topics uh, were touched. Uh, and if we put them together, what uh, Pekka said, indeed, for big uh, innovative technological companies, uh, those who manage to be uh, the leaders on the new wave on innovative cycle. Practically, there are no clear examples of this. Maybe only one example is IBM, which managed to revive its uh, leadership after a very heavy crisis period in the end of the 80s, beginning of 90s, when it happened uh, that they lost their mainstream approach. And the company managed to renovate completely itself. But these are very few examples. And taking into account uh, a uh, remarkable problem of the state uh, regulating uh, and uh, the government regulating in the companies with the government with the state participation for example m and d uh, where the company where the government participation re really creates big problems and uh, for Russian companies, uh, it is indeed very difficult to work with uh, corporate and venture funds. Indeed, this is not only the culture problem, but also the m and uh, problem. And I lived through two m and uh, processes, and in both cases, this m and a uh, was uh, a real, a real horror. Uh, I can uh, assure assure you that for uh, top management and middle uh, age, middle level management, this is a real uh, 
uh, horrific experience to integrate um, an alien body inside your company. And for the state uh, culture, it is indeed very difficult. And uh, uh, it is necessary to change the mentality because if a company becomes uh, partially owned by the state, they have to st remain the leaders. And this is like uh, for a surgeon to make uh, the operation on uh, his brain. And, uh, it is almost uh, not possible. But in my view, this is not a very specific case for the Russian practice. I think this is a general problem, global problem, which exists almost everywhere. And uh, taking this into account, maybe uh, the participation of the state must be minimized in the process like this. Maybe uh, the regulatory function must remain of the state, but we have to put away the investment function of the state. or. Uh, like it was said today, the state will remain and will continue its functions as the main investor. It's, it's a hard job. Uh, my company was doing 215 acquisitions uh, when I was in active duty, and big and small. And typically the integration was the most difficult for the smallest ones, which totally different culture. Uh, the reason why I was asking, by the way, this question is that not later than Monday I should give my view on this issue, what should be the government regulation on this purchasing, so I can now use the results of this expert panel as a final statement, what I'm going to give to the government. But actually, I would like to ask from the uh, Chinese colleague, uh, a special com uh, is there... Um, because the Prime Minister uh, was referring in his speech today about variety of the different kind of elements to facilitate innovation. Is there today in China, for example, uh, China Unicom or China Mobile or Huawei, do they have certain kind of a mandatory quota that they have to buy small companies or is there some kind of legislation that Alibaba have to do something on this? Or is it based more on the free market um, rules, in a sense? Because this is the debate. Uh, should there be some kind of limits and, and to make the exit market for the small startups? How it's in China? Uh, 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 I speak uh, use Chinese uh, maybe more clear. 我认为中国政府在对科技企业发展里面，就应该是没有出现很明确的要求某一个企业买一个公司或者是对某个项目进行投资这样的行为。Позвольте uh, let me speak in Chinese to make it more clear. As far as I know, the Chinese government does not give uh, direct indications or orders for high-tech industries or companies uh, so that they make any ac actions for M&A. Uh, nevertheless, Chinese government, uh, in the sphere of innovations and preparation of uh, uh, st staff training, invest a lot and uh, implement lots of effort. And as an example, our company receives uh, annually more than 100 uh, billion or 150 billion yuan from the state budget. But this is not that important. Which is more important is that our company created 25 centers of the, uh, research and development, and all of them received uh, special incentives from the state, from the point of view of the territory, uh, site and space, etc. 
and uh, thanks to the support from the government, we managed to create the biggest in the world uh, system for the development of innovations. In general, this system includes more than 30 companies and they carried out IPOs and they have listings at uh, Hong Kong and American stock exchanges. Including the companies which are parts of our corporation. Besides, we have uh, 28 other companies, similar, similar companies, in which we participate to this to that extent. And uh, we should not uh, forget the fact uh, that our company uh, made a great input into the development of high-tech sector and the economic development of China. And that's why I think uh, that uh, relations between uh, the companies of IT sector and the government must be interactive and uh, mu mutually fruitful. They have to hear each other and understand each other. It means uh, that on one hand, uh, it would be positive uh, to reduce all regulatory and permi permission activities and uh, it would be necessary that, they come, that the state invest more into the creation of favorable conditions for the innovations. We also hope uh, that uh, uh, the tax burden will be redistributed properly and uh, more chances will be given to smaller companies uh, to present themselves and maybe to uh, representatives of youth and young people. Uh, recently in, the, in America, a research uh, report was published saying that the center of the American economy is now shifting from Wall Street to Silicon Valley. And in China, we have a similar tendency. For example, in the past, to create a big company, it was necessary to uh, spend 20 or t 10 or 20 years. But today, uh, in uh, Beijing uh, Technopark or uh, Junbuanjmu, only three years are necessary to create a big corporation. So I'm sure, independent whether we uh, apply the American experience or we use uh, the Chinese experiences and tendencies, the state must increase the support for the small and middle-sized companies, uh, meaning innovative companies. And thank you very much. It is a pleasure for me to, uh, to communicate with Russian and international colleagues. I think it's always the hard to have a final conclusions, but especially when you are out from the room, it's even more difficult. Uh, but, but I don't ask to you to make the final conclusions. Actually, uh, what I would like to ask from you, we have discussed, we started the panel talking about uh, real, um, how to use uh, startups and the new technology in what uh, we heard from the Barcelona example. We have discussed how it looks like in a Helsinki standpoint. We have checked uh, what, uh, how uh, Chinese government is stimulating the innovation. But I will ask you, as a, because you are also a businessman, what do you think about an idea that, that uh, how, or what should be done that we would get Russian entrepreneurs, Russian businessmen, to use more startups and innovative companies, purchase them and integrate them into their culture? 
and get innovation in doing that because having the liquidity to exit market for the small company seems to be absolutely essential and I think we came to the conclusion that it's not that we make a law that everybody should spend 10% of the R&D for it but what should be done from the cultural standpoint what what we could do to make that happen sir Dear friends, good afternoon. I'm sorry for being late and uh, I'm quite thankful to Pekka for moderating this panel and uh, uh, my thanks to all the participants to, uh, of this panel. It's a good uh, question, what to do to support and uh, incentivate uh, uh, the, the activities of uh, Russian entrepreneurs and the results of uh, startups from the point of view of uh, to stimulate the demand for the products of the startups in the real sector of the economy. Well, first of all, it is necessary to form uh, uh, the understanding of the main economic players in the Russian markets that the innovations really give uh, real economic impact and it help uh, to them to carry out their strategies. We can talk a, a lot uh, that innovations are good and it is necessary to invest, but uh, not before the real economic sector and the uh, companies understand how to implement their strategies, how to get the profits, what uh, will be the benefits. Without the creation of this understanding and uh, the practical results of the innovative activities, the pragmatic, practical business will uh, judge this as another startup, as a test or the beginning of the process. The problem of the Russian market is uh, that the state uh, is present actively within the economy and we do not have the necessary level of competition. And if we don't have competition, the demand for innovations is uh, not very high because the state does not stimulate you to acquire innovative products because on one hand they are more expensive but they can allow you to be far in advance of your competitors so if you don't have competitors then you don't need to be far ahead of your competitors and the, innovate, the innovations are not uh, the global thing they live in uh, the local markets, but on the other hand, for those who work in the global market, they can indeed get uh, the benefits. I think that we are at the first, at the end of the first stage of uh, the innovative policy, and it is time to form the agenda to dot zero and understanding uh, the role of innovations and uh, what are the benefits of innovations and uh, understanding this we have to pass to the practical measures of the development of innovations and implementing the innovations into the real life both for real uh, for the state owned companies and for the private companies and now uh, we have to transfer the understanding of the good uh, things related to innovations to the real agenda. Uh, this can be done through economic uh, methods uh, and including what uh, Dmitry Anatolyevich Medvedev mentioned today. Uh, it can be done defining the priority of uh, the innovations for those companies where the government participates as one of the partners. Well, this will be certain enforcement, but I see that many companies already understand the practical value of uh, this approach, and they understand the new quality uh, allowed by the innovations. This includes the companies of the power sector, 
power generation sector and uh, introduction of uh, innovative solutions uh, in the oil sector of Russia is very important because now we are kind of separated or isolated from the Western technologies due to the sanctions and this will stimulate our developments in the oil extraction and processing and this uh, could be the practical approach which will determine the correct place of innovations in our private sector and uh, in our state companies. The expert council of the government, together with Skolkva, Bakaya, Rosnan and other institutions, have prepared a report on how to realize the innovative policy. Innovation 2.0 is its name. So in this report, same main threads of, of uh, development of innovations for the period 2015 to 2020 uh, are determined. So these are very pragmatic and very accurate steps for both government and business to develop innovations. Uh, which includes increase uh, of innovation stim uh, stimulated by the government, as well as the government's support of the companies working for innovations. But to close the session, I just want to, tell, to close this. First of all, thanking all the participants who joined here today, thanking for the audience. But um, to conclude with uh, two, uh, two words, first of all, Somebody asked from me once that what was the most important part of the Finnish innovative system and startup boom six years ago. And the answer is because Nokia was in trouble. Nokia was in trouble which released tens of thousands of engineers out to the market, support with techs, support from the whole government. It generated hundreds and hundreds of news companies and some of them are already in the billion dollar league already, for example in game and entertainment. Um, six years ago, I was in St. Petersburg Economic Forum in a debate with Mr. Kudrin, um, the f finance minister, former finance minister, and he asked from me in front of the some people that what needs to happen in Russia, or what is the most important thing that the big companies would utilize innovations and startups, what needs to happen? And I said in front of all the audience that no, well, if you want to have a one factor, if the oil price would be $45, people would be very interested about the new businesses. Big companies would be very interested in to modernize everybody. No, well, this is not my official statement that I hope the oil price to be $45, but I think that there is a wisdom that in the tough times, what are now driven by the sanctions and many other things, I hope that the companies will take serious actions to utilize the innovations, the startups, and that power what is available in all levels. With these words, I want to thank you, and I wish you a wonderful day here in Moscow. Thank you. Spasiba.